have a slide of that. Uh, uh, I think there's a point of that. It's probably so far away. Thank you for the very kind invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to join you tonight and share some thoughts about uh, reproducible research, where we stand, what are the challenges that we're facing, and uh, what might be some improvements. So, microphone. microphone. Okay. Um, let's see. Does that work better? Okay. Doesn't feel very nice, but okay. <laughs> So what do we mean by reproducibility? Um, there is a lot of discussion about that, and if you look at the literature across all 22 major fields of science, there's more people talking about reproducibility in the last few years. There's a, a geometric growth of views of terms like reproducibility and reproducibility of results. But there's different types of reproducibility. There's reproducibility of methods, and I think that I'm speaking to an audience that is on a daily basis, working and thinking about reproducibility of methods, reproducibility of results that I think all scientists are thinking about on a daily basis, and reproducibility of inferences that probably all scientists are debating and fighting each other on a daily basis. So reproducibility of methods means that if you have some software, you have some script, you have some data, if you run these data on that script and that software, you get the same result. As we know, this doesn't happen necessarily, but we are glad when we see it happen, and very often we waste a day, a week, a month trying to find what bug is ruining our life. Reproducibility of results means that we run yet another study and we get the same result. How often do we do that? Very, not very often. Reproducibility of inferences means that we see the same data, and we have 500 people in the room, and we get 500 different conclusions about what these data mean. Different fields have some patterns that are not the same, and that might affect what reproducible research means. They differ in the degree of determinism, the signal to measurement error ratio, the complexity of designs and measurement tools, the closeness of fit between hypothesis and experimental design, what kind of statistical analysis methods are used and are popular in the field? What is the typical heterogeneity that people will not scream if they see some differences in the results? Whether there is a culture of replication or not, whether replication is thought that, we, of course, we need to replicate, or is thought to be, this is me too, don't do it, don't waste your time. Whether there is a culture of transparency, a culture of cumulative knowledge, rather than just take one snapshot and then forget about it. What are the criteria that we set to say that we have found something and we believe that it is true, that it, it is conveying some information? And finally, what are we going to do with that research? Is it just exploration out of curiosity that may have some use 500 years later? Or is it something that we want to move directly to industrial application and affect human lives and uh, technology and how things work or do not work? Our data nowadays pretty much look like this. They look very beautiful, but you cannot tell what they mean. And, you know, this is uh, actually all the data that you can imagine of. This is uh, uh, a picture that contains the entire science in the last few years with 20 million recent papers and 2 million patents. And using a co-citation network, we identify about 200,000 different disciplines. Uh, each one of these disciplines is using the scientific method. But how we mean that I'm using the scientific method, if you ask a scientist working in one field and a scientist working in another, they will have very different versions of what they feel is the most essential components of the scientific method. Here's one field that went through a uh, uh, reproducibility crisis in the last few years and a lot of soul searching. Uh, psychology needs soul searching. This is what it is about. And for a long time, psychology didn't want to have replication. It was considered to be a sine qua non uh, that uh, you should not replicate because you're wasting your time. So about six years ago, I put together whatever empirical data existed 
in that field, and this is the summary that I created, that less than 1% of the literature in that field is likely to be optimal, meaning that someone found a correct result and that was also replicated. Less than 1% was self-correcting, someone got it wrong, but then someone corrected that mistake. Um, less than 1% was false non-replication, that something was found, but then someone tried to replicate this and did some mistake that didn't allow the replication to be shown. And about 2% was perpetuated fallacy. Someone got it wrong, and the same bias was repeated again, and it was wrong again. About 43% was unconfirmed genuine discoveries, uh, meaning that um, someone found something, it was correct, but nobody wanted to try it again. And about 53% was unchallenged fallacy, which means that something was wrong, it found its place in the literature, and there it stayed. A couple of years ago, a coalition of, 100, of uh, 270 psychologists, along with their teams, published the results of the largest reproducibility check in the history of psychological science. They took 100 papers from their top journals, and they created protocols that were vetted and compared to the original ones. The original authors were asked to make sure that this is exactly what is going to happen. Was that what you had in mind? Uh, are we approximating what you did as closely as possible? Obviously, you know, psychology circumstances and context might change, but at least there was agreement that that was as close as it was possible. The results have been read in very different ways, but about two-thirds of these high-profile publications could not be reproduced. No matter how you want to, to see it, um, you can see here the p-values in the original papers and the follow-up uh, reproducibility checks, and the effect sizes were less than half on average compared to uh, what the original studies had found. This led to a reproducibility war in the field that we have seen in many other fields where such efforts are currently becoming more popular. Uh, so some very prestigious psychologists that were not part of the 270 teams said that everything that these 270 teams did was wrong. But otherwise, psychology is perfectly correct. Hmm? Um, so, you know, there can be extreme interpretations, and obviously there was some back and forth uh, about this, but, but th the truth is that psychological science, which I believe is a very rigorous science, because all the terms about bias and many of the methods that we use, not only in social sciences, but also in biomedical sciences, they have their onset. You know, experimenter bias stems from psychology about 60 years ago. If you look at any bias terms, there's usually some psychologists that had some saying about it very early on. So I would argue that that was the best set of experiments that psychological science had ever done. And if that was cor completely wrong, you know, then what might be correct? It's very difficult to reach equilibrium if you have a situation where a reproducibility effort reaches a different conclusion compared to an original. It leads to reproducibility wars on interpretation of what that means. Some people would say that that was unsuccessful. Others would say, well, no, it was successful. Others would say it's un uninterpretable. Others will question whether it was exact enough. And many others will start building other pieces of evidence, trying to think about conceptual reproducibility and triangulation and so forth. Here's some other reproducibility efforts from the Reproducibility Cancer Biology Project that started releasing its results less than a year ago in eLife and uh, where last week another study was uh, published that uh, showed that the original could not be reproduced at all, but actually the editorial said that that's not a problem, and may indeed be so. So it's this pattern where you see the original result um, in the upper estimate and the reproducibility effort in the second estimate and then the meta-analysis, what you see there is that non-reproducible. I, I would say, no, this seems very consistent. The two estimates about uh, how effective uh, this particular drug might be in a, a mouse model, a xenograft model of uh, lung cancer, seems to be 
roughly the same, and the confidence intervals largely overlap. However, if you look carefully at the protocol, the protocol had specified that one particular analysis would be done for that primary outcome, and that analysis would have to account for some multiplicity of comparisons. And once you account for that multiplicity of comparisons, the confidence intervals for the reproducibility effort cross the null, and the original definition of whether it would be claimed to be reproducible or not, the pre-specified definition was it would not cross the null in terms of 95% confidence intervals. So I would argue that even though one might conclude this is not reproducible, I would say this looks very reproducible, but I would go a second step further and I would ask, so what is it that we say that is reproducible, or some people say it's not reproducible. And then you look at what that claim is. The claim is that a drug that has been out there, cimetidine, for something like 40 years, is an extremely effective treatment for lung cancer. The drug has been out there for decades. Lung cancer affects millions of people. We haven't really noticed that. I would argue that the next step from that discovery that came out of searching public gene expression data would be to do a randomized trial of cimetidine versus nothing in people with lung cancer. I would bet it would not show an effect. But I may be wrong, and I hope that I would be wrong. So the question is, what is the gold standard for each reproducibility crane? And in some cases, we may be able to take that extra translational step. In other cases, we may not have such an easy translational th step that we can think of. Here's another example where the confidence intervals clearly do not overlap. Actually, if you look at the first uh, panel, there's no overlap at all, and the estimate of effect in the reproducibility attempt is exactly zero, and with very tight confidence intervals. One would argue that no one would question that that's a result that could not be reproduced, and that could mean different things, but was not reproduced. Well, even for that result, the original authors said that our results were perfectly fine, and it was just an error of the reproducibility effort. But again, the reproducibility effort had been agreed by everyone before it started, even by the original authors. Scientific discovery has become a boring nuisance. I increasingly believe that. I read all these results and I'm just bored. 96% of the biomedical literature claims significant results. We did a text mining exercise including all the abstracts in PubMed and about a million full text papers. Whenever there was a p-value that we identified, 96% of these papers had statistically significant results. The good news is that percentage is decreasing to 95% currently, <laughs> but that's not good enough. I, I, I think it's extremely implausible, even though I do believe that we make great progress in science, that 96% of our papers are statistically significant and also novel, because if you read these papers, almost always they say that they're both significant and novel. Well, if you read Nature, Science, and PNAS, the, the top journals, and you look at p-values in the tables and the figures, practically all of them are statistically significant. If you have some adjustment for multiplicity, and obviously this is not something that was happening in 1999, uh, um, but it is happening in 2017, if you have some correction for multiplicity, then that percentage drops to 87%. Again, though, I think this is a very high percentage. How do we get all these significant results? Well, we have extremely good analytical tools, and we have lots of very smart people working with them. Almost any result can be obtained, and that leads to what I call vibration of effects and the Janus phenomenon. Janus was a Greek Roman god. His uh, feature was that he could see in both directions, and uh, this means that he could obtain both types of results, depending on what result was uh, more popular or more likely to be published in Nature or Science. Um, so here's an analysis of uh, 
one of the best databases that we have, I think the best database in the US in terms of a, a population sample, the, the National Household Survey. We are analyzing the association of uh, different factors with mortality. So the further to the right panel that has that V shape is uh, vitamin E or alpha tocopherol and whether the levels of vitamin E are associated with the risk of death in the US population. What I'm showing you here is one million different analysis to address the very same question. And how do you get that? Well, mortality is affected by lots of things. Um, age, gender, whether people exercise, what they eat, whether they have cancer, whether they have heart disease, uh, lots of other things. So one could build a regression model including or not including each one of these characteristics and there's m at least 20 such characteristics that you may want to consider. Two to the 20 options of different models emerge, which is about a million models. So a million points are shown here with uh, the results uh, uh, showing the uh, p-value, uh, the minus log 10 p-value, and the hazard ratio. About 70% of these results suggest that vitamin E decreases the risk of death. About 30% of these results suggest that vitamin E increases the risk of death. So d depending on what I like to show and what seems to be more publishable, I can get pretty much any result uh, that could be presentable. In an observational setting, meaning without very stringent experimental randomized control, extremely tiny bias can cause p-values and their distribution, what we call p-curves, to resemble the distribution that one would assume to see under genuine effects. This is uh, some simulations that uh, I did with uh, Stefan Bruns, um, where we found that even with a omitted variable error of 0.01 d, standard deviations on average, which is really imperceptible bias, you can get a picture of generated results if you run millions of studies that would resemble exactly what you expect to get if there were true non-null effects there, even though everything is null. There's just a, a tiny bit of bias of 0.01 standard deviations. The problem is, is compounded by the typical recipe of research practices that is highly prevalent in many fields. Not all fields, but many fields, they work with solo silent investigators. Each one of them has to prove that they're a very good principal investigator and they can beat competition of other principal investigators. Resources are limited. Funding for science, unfortunately, is not what we would like it to be. This means that unavoidably they can work with small sample size studies. They need to survive. They need to find significant results. Therefore, they're forced to cherry pick one or the best hypotheses. Very often, this is done post hoc. Lenient statistical criteria are used because otherwise nothing will cross the desirable level of uh, discovery. No registration is made, no data sharing happens because that gives ammunition to competitors, and no replication is done because if you try to replicate, you have spent two years, and now you will spend another two years to just show that you found nothing. Not a very attractive idea unless we are incentivized and rewarded to find nothing. But that's a little bit difficult to explain to funders. Under these circumstances, this is a, a typical pattern of what might emerge. fMRI studies are likely to find a large number of foci only if they're very small. This is uh, data from close to 1,800 different data sets of fMRI, and I'm plotting here the number of foci that are claimed to be discovered. As a function of the sample size, the only way to find a very large number of studies is to perform, a very large number of fossils to perform very small studies. With larger studies, the number of fossils start disappearing, 
And maybe if we were to perform even larger studies for many of these phenotypes or tasks or traits, there will be no fossae that would survive. It's not just fMRI. Uh, a couple of years ago, actually, it's almost five years now, we published a paper where we looked at very different areas of neuroscience and ranging from basic research all the way to clinical research. And we found that the common denominator was what we call power failure. Most of the published studies were very small. They had very limited power to detect even modest effects. And this means that many interesting discoveries were missed, but at the same time, most of the discoveries that were made were likely to be false positives, even with negligible minor bias. We have seen that in many other areas. This is uh, another paper that we published recently in PLOS Biology, where we looked at neuroscience, uh, psychology, and medical cognitive uh, disciplines. Again, power failure was the dominant theme across these different disciplines. Some fields have performed replication, and some have even adopted it as a sine qua non. Empirical studies in such fields where replication practices are common suggest that most of the initially uh, claimed statistically significant results in association type of research are either false positives or substantially exaggerated. One such field is human genome epidemiology. Until 10 years ago, the way that we were working in trying to identify genetic variants that are associated with the risk of the disease was pretty much the same on what is still happening in most observational research, where we try to think carefully about the biology ahead of time, identify a few targets, and then test these few targets for association with some outcome of interest. When we managed to change the paradigm and screen the entire genome in genome-wide studies and then with sequencing, and increase our sample size with very large consortia, with hundreds of investigators, and with meta-analysis of genome-wide assessments, and with stringent analysis and very careful analytical protocols, the success rate for the candidate gene discoveries of the past, which amounted to tens of thousands of papers, was 1.2%. So 98.8% .8 of these papers that were published, tens of thousands of them, were not reproduced in more agnostic, thorough, carefully analyzed studies. Multiple efforts in preclinical research have focused on reproducibility over the last uh, six, seven years, and most of them until recently were run by the industry. I'm talking to an audience that uh, I understand has both academic and industry components, and therefore I'm preaching to the core when I'm telling you that industry really wants reliable results to be able to build some successful translation of uh, these applications. If they use something that comes out of a major university and they spend half a billion dollars on that, but then they don't get what they were supposed to get, that's really a big failure and they have to go back to the drawing board. So it's not surprising that several teams in industry try to reproduce multiple high-profile, high-impact factor publications that were highly promising for drug targets or new biologics, and their success rate varied from 0% to 25%. Glenn Begley concluded when his team could only reproduce uh, six of 53 landmark studies for oncology drug target projects that the failure to win the war on cancer has been blamed on many factors, but recently a new culprit has emerged. Too many basic scientific discoveries are wrong. Similar signals have been seen with a very wide array of different methods and different tools. In microarray research, in animal studies, in uh, biology models, uh, in genome sequencing, uh, antibodies, uh, uh, ELISA tests, and so forth. And we have seen non-reproducibility signals across neuroscience, pharmacology, genomics, bioinformatics, stem cell biology, oncology, in vitro testing, chemistry-led discovery, computational biology, pathology, biomarkers, organizational psychology, and also all types of observational research. Um, some 
are probably worse or more worrisome than others. So for example, in observational research, if you look at how many claims of observational associations of specific diet ingredients with major outcomes like cancer and uh, cardiovascular disease and, and death have been reproduced in carefully controlled randomized trials. Stan Young has published a paper showing a reproducibility of zero out of 52. When we do have replications, we could perform meta-analysis. We could put all the data together and try to assess whether they show some pattern, whether they show some consistency, but also whether there are some hints that biases might be affecting that body of evidence of similar studies on the same question. This is a tricky game. If all the studies on the same question agree with each other, it could be that everything is correct, but it could be that everything is wrong. So if, if the same bias has been repeated across a million studies, the results of the meta-analysis will show to be perfectly consistent, very strong, but the bias will just be ubiquitous. So what we're testing for here is whether there are some hints of bias that kind of distort the consistency of the results across studies. Along with Dan Fanelli and Rodrigo Costas, we looked at meta-analysis that we could identify across any field of science, across the 22 major disciplines of science, and we asked on whether there's hints for 17 different types of biases. Most biases were detected, or hints of biases were detected in most fields. However, some biases were more common in some fields, and others were more common in, in others. For example, small study effects, which means that small studies tend to give more prominent results, more exaggerated effects compared to larger studies, was a very prominent feature in the social sciences, was very strong in biological sciences, was not that prominent though in the physical sciences. So there are differences across different fields, different disciplines, and this means that mapping the footprint of biases in each field may give us some guidance about what might be some high priority targets that we need to fix. This leads to the solutions part. We are not desperate. We have lots of solutions. Science has made great progress. This laptop is working, even though you cannot read my presentation because there's pillars in the room. <laughs> so, some solutions have already worked in specific fields and may need to be considered to be expanded in other fields as well. Uh, these 200,000 clusters of scientific fields that I showed you up front, some of them communicate with each other, but others do not. And maybe we have plenty of room to learn from each other. Other solutions are more speculative. There's some weird person like me who says, do this. And you, know, you should be very careful because you should ask me, what is the evidence to do that? Some of these solutions may actually do more harm than good. So we need an evidence base before we decide to change everything that we do and how we practice. Solutions can be thought of at several steps in the scientific investigation process. At the level of designing, conducting, analyzing, and reporting studies. It probably makes sense that if we act on a preemptive way earlier on, it will be easier. We all know that if we have a horrible study that has been very poorly designed uh, or very poorly run, you know, then we're stuck with data. that We just don't know what to do with them. And obviously, any data can be analyzed, but it's too late. I, I think that we are running into trouble. The solutions can be grouped into 12 families. Large-scale collaborative research, adoption of replication culture, registration of studies, protocols, analysis codes, data sets, raw data, and results, sharing of data, protocols, materials, software, and other tools, reproducibility checks and related practices, containment of conflicted sponsors and authors, more appropriate statistical methods, 
standardization of definitions and analysis, more stringent thresholds for claiming discoveries or successes, improvement of study design standards, improvements in peer review, reporting, and dissemination of research, and better training of the scientific workforce in methods and statistical literacy. For these solutions to work, we need to find ways to incentivize them. We need to find ways to reward people who do them, who follow them, who uh, adopt them. Large-scale collaboration clearly has worked in many areas that are dealing with massive amounts of data. As I showed you, genetic epidemiology was getting nowhere with the reproducibility of 1%, and currently the reproducibility has gone up to 99%. Before we decided to join forces and standardize our approaches and perform replication as a sine qua non, we thought that we had discovered 359 genes that regulate smoking behavior, and these had been published one at a time in major prestigious journals. When we joined forces and we had hundreds of teams include their data in the same analysis with careful replication, only one of these genes survived. Some others emerged, but there were not 359, but I think that we're on a much more solid ground now, and whatever is produced at least can be replicated. Each field needs to decide who is going to do the replication. Is it going to be the same investigators? Do we need different investigators? And if so, does it make a difference if these are investigators of the same school or we need some sort of contrarian replication by people of competing theories and hypotheses? Or some combinations of the above? Many replications may be amenable to distributing information into a very large number of users and citizen scientists who can perform these analyses. So lots of highly intensive computational problems can be split into tens of thousands of users who could try to replicate different bits and pieces of that. Levels of registration are also something that are hotly debated. Most fields do not register the work that is going to be done. And this is um, okay when the work that is going to be done is of such nature that not even the investigators know what exactly is going to be done. This is not uncommon. Exploratory research means that I have no clue what I'm doing, but I wake up at three o'clock in the morning with a wonderful idea. I don't know where it came and why and how, and I don't need to tell you about it. I will just uh, be sleepless working until eight o'clock in the morning and then find something very interesting. That's okay. There's no need to register this. But I need to tell you when I publish this, not necessarily that I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, but that that was exploration. And then someone could try to reproduce it. There's other levels of registration. Level one is registration of data set. Uh, I see that as some way of registering our nuclear arsenal. So I can tell you that I have these databases in my computer and they include so many thousands of variables on so many millions of participants worth of data. And if I want, I can push the button on my software and launch so many billions of chi-square p-values against you. Uh, so you, know, you, you get a sense of my destructive power. Um, and this is enough to get a sense of what is the multiplicity involved. Level two would be registration of a protocol, if a protocol exists. Level three would be registration of an analysis plan, if an analysis plan exists. Level four, registration of both the analysis plan and all the raw data. And level five would be open live streaming, uh, which is pretty much what happened when an investigator tried to reproduce the claim by NASA scientists that they had found alien life in bacteria that could use uh, arsenic instead of phosphorus for their DNA backbone. About 100 journals are using registered reports nowadays, and I think that the number will continue to go up. What this means is that the study is reviewed and provisionally accepted without the results. It's accepted based on the quality and the standards that it uses in what it's planning to do, then the results come on board, the tables and the figures are populated, and after a, a more brief check, the paper is published. 
You all know that sharing is not easy. Some fields, and I'm sure that many scientists in this audience are very accustomed with uh, sharing data, some fields have managed to make the necessary steps. Others are lagging behind. A few years ago, we looked at the 50 highest impact factor journals that pi published primary research, and we asked how many of those have policies in place for sharing data, for sharing materials, for sharing protocols, and so forth. Lots of green color. This is good news. It means that there's lots of policies for sharing and even making it a prerequisite for publication. But the last column, which is very tiny font, and you would not be able to read it even if you would not have the pillars in front of you, has lots of zeros, which means that um, zero out of 10 papers that we screened actually adhere to these policies. In many fields, sharing is not easy. It's not really fair to ask for an investigator to reinvent the wheel each time he or she publishes a new paper. Create a new repository, create new standards for sharing, create new rules of engagement, decide who can use these data, how and where the gatekeeping is going to happen and so forth. All of that needs to be decided at a centralized level and the successful examples are those that have managed to build processes that the data can be shared widely from thousands of investigators without each one of them having to reinvent the wheel. Even though some fields do that extensively, they're the minority. A random sample of 500 papers in PubMed from 2000 to 2014 shows that about half of them have primary data. When we looked in depth, and these are papers published from 2000 to 2014, so pretty recent, we saw that none of them shared everything in terms of the raw data, and only one of them had the full detailed protocol available. Actually, that was a study that had published the protocol as a separate paper, so there was an incentive to, to do that. We have repeated that exercise for 2015 to 2017. It is getting a bit better, but still sharing is the minority. There are fields that are transforming more rapidly. I mentioned psychological science. Some journals have adopted a badge system where you get a badge if you share. And these journals, like psychological science, have gone up from a sharing of close to 0% before adopting that system of reward to close to 40% of their papers having full data sharing. Reproducibility of computational methods is something that we can really spend uh, a whole day on. About a year ago, we published these recommendations in science where we tried to advocate that there's different levels that we can improve the reproducibility of computational approaches. We recognize that not all fields would be ready for the perfect step where everything is shared, everything is open, everything goes through a check and verified that it works, that the same results can be obtained. But there are lower levels that probably all journals could adopt. For example, have a link. And if there is a link that says there's some software there, or there is some database, or there's a protocol, or there's some script, just click on that link and make sure that there's no error sign. If you want to spend more time, that's welcome, but at least clicking on that, on that link would show you that some or many of those actually give an error sign and that could be easily corrected. Better statistics and methods can also make a difference. I mentioned already the need for transparent and perhaps registered when registration is due statistical analysis plans. We also need to think more carefully, and again, I'm preaching to the core because this is an audience that is highly sophisticated in computation we need to get better statistical training and improve literacy and numeracy of the scientific workforce at large. Very often, most scientists are just pushing a little bit of statistics light education in their curriculum. But nowadays, where science is extremely computational intensive in almost all fields, this is not enough. Better study designs can make a difference. Some standard features like randomization and blinding of investigators in animal experiments should be routine. They cost nothing. Uh, they save us from lots of trouble, but currently they're used only 10% of the time. Here's one example where 
A very simple method, or seemingly so, was used by about 40,000 papers before it was realized that it could be glaringly wrong. fMRI inferences for spatial extent have inflated false positive rates when the traditional parametric methods are employed. This means that a p-value of 0.04 may actually be a 0.8 in terms of what the family-wise error rate really is. It's not that all 40,000 papers are wrong. It could be that two or 3,000 of them were affected. However, it's something that seems very easy but didn't get noticed until way after we had published a, a large volume of literature. As a temporizing measure, a few months ago, along with uh, 71 other authors, uh, I joined a paper on redefining statistical significance. I think none of us really believe that this is going to be the best solution, but we all authored that paper because we felt that we needed a temporizing measure for fields that are still using p-values of 0.05 as the default to move their threshold by one zero to 0 0.005. Based on the distribution of p-values across the biomedical literature, this will shift about 30% of the claim significant results into the area of non-significance. Most of those would have been false positives that would be a good move to move them there. It's just a temporizing measure, and if you think more carefully, one would realize that null hypothesis significance testing, which is the dominant paradigm, is probably the best choice in about 20% of life sciences and biomedicine, and other types of approaches would need to be used in 80% of the literature. Institutions can also help. Institutions can build a culture of continuing methodological education, training students, postdoctoral fellows, and investigators. Many of the problems of research practices are very complex. They're not amenable to easy, randomized experiments, so we may need to try to model very complex environments and very complex processes. We can learn from other disciplines like economics and game theory. This is one such example where, along with David Grimes, we build a model of science with 11 equations that includes three cohorts of scientists, a diligent cohort, a careless cohort, and an unethical cohort. Of course, almost everybody is diligent when you know, scientific life starts, but we show that unless there are incentives and rewards for the diligent cohort, if everyone can get the same reward and the careless cohort can do the same by cutting corners with less effort, with less investment, very quickly, gradually, the careless cohort will take over. And then maybe even the unethical cohort will take over, which probably starts from a very, very low percentage of like 1%. So we need to find ways to reward the best practices, to reward the best science. How do we do that? I think this is a science on its own. It's a research field on its own. And meta-research, or research on research, is trying exactly to address this type of questions. How do we optimally perform research? How do we communicate research? How do we verify research? How do we evaluate research? And how do we reward investigation? There's hundreds of organizations currently, scientific organizations, that work in different interfaces of these five axes of how to improve scientific investigation. One of them is Metrix, uh, the center that I have launched uh, at Stanford with uh, lots of colleagues across all schools of the university and many affiliated faculties, uh, faculty worldwide, where we try to create a connector hub for such efforts. At the end of the day, to be successful, we need to re-engineer our reward system. Our reward system until now is paying a lot of attention on productivity and productivity is perfectly fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with publishing papers, there's nothing wrong with getting funding, and more funding is, is more than welcome. However, we also need to find ways to reward scientists who score higher on quality, who are more reproducible in their work, who share more and more openly, and whose work has more translational impact when the research is applied rather than early exploration. 
Scientists' reputations are based on getting it right, not being right. We cannot be right all the time. I cannot count the number of mistakes and errors that I have made in my career. And I'm sure that the ones that I have not even realized are far more than the ones that I have realized. But we do want to get it right eventually. So I think that that reward system should not be something that is imposed by some bureaucrat or some police force. It should be something that we as scientists want to implement because we believe that this is the way to move forward and have better outcomes in our work. Maybe we need some sort of a revolution. And about a year ago, we published that manifesto for reproducible science that describes what might be the steps for that revolution to be more constructive. There's many players, there's many stakeholders in that process. It's not just scientists, it's also journals, it's funders, it's uh, institutions, sometimes it's the journal public. These different stakeholders have different priorities. Some of them want to publish more, others want to get more funding, others want to translate whatever they get into something meaningful that works, and some want to make profit. All of these outcomes and all of these objectives are perfectly fine, provided that we can synchronize them in a way that we get the best possible science. To conclude, reproducibility has different meanings across different scientific disciplines, but eventually all of them aim at enhancing our trust in scientific findings. There are many possible interventions that may improve the efficiency of research practices and the reproducibility of the scientific literature. Empirical meta-research then would be useful not only to assess the prevalence of problems, but also to assess the effectiveness and the potential harms of interventions that try to make research more reproducible and useful. Special thanks to a number of colleagues who have tolerated me over the years working in different projects that I shared with you today. And uh, even more thanks to you for listening to me after dinner. That must have been cruel. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think that original discoveries can do extremely well uh, with, uh, with these approaches. Uh, so I, I try to be very careful to not be restrictive uh, in how these processes are going to be implemented. As I said, exploration is perfectly fine and maybe the large majority of research needs to be exploratory. Um, Different types of practices need to be applied in different parts of the translational pipeline. But we need to be very clear about what step are we talking about. Are we talking about discovery and exploration? Are we talking about early validation? Are we talking about application or final translation into something useful? So I, I, I'm not sure that any of these steps would be an impediment to discovery. I would argue that based on what we have seen in many fields, uh, they would facilitate and expedite discovery for multiple reasons. One, because you get more truthful results. Two, because you get less uh, waste and noise that people may be spending then lots of effort trying to pursue. And three, because you synthesize more systematically evidence so that you can think more carefully about what might be the next area to launch a discovery aspect. Rather than testing of the 
Yeah. Um, but did I negate testing of the observation? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that um, one needs to exclude the other. Uh, more accurate measurement is, is useful, but uh, much of what I described actually is mostly pertinent on the testing part. You know, how, how do you optimize the chances of the testing part being more reliable? So none of these solutions are trying to discard any parts of the process. They're just trying to see what works in each part of the process to make it more efficient. Uh, hi. First off, your talk is terrifying. Um, <laughs> but um, all right. So as someone who works in, in biology and data science, um, it, you know, I'm, I, I rely on the statistical, you know, the kind of all the data that I collect has some statistical value in, in making predictions. And so it leads me to wonder whether or not, you know, do we really need to replicate every single experiment or, you know, is there a role for data science in kind of flagging things? And, it, you know, either it's wrong or it's statistically significant because that's the other kind of thing you were discussing and, and whether or not computational tools can help uh, fill in some of those gaps. So uh, the question of whether we need to replicate everything or if not, what exactly should we replicate and what we should not replicate uh, is, I think, open. My perception, which may be wrong, is that uh, I would prioritize replication for some types of results that have some key features. One of them is if lots of further experimentation or data collection or assessments or, or pathways of exploration depend on that result. I, I would like to make sure as much as possible that I'm on solid ground before I pursue that. If it's something that nobody will pursue, that's okay, we can leave it aside. Second feature, if something has reached the point that it's no longer just curiosity uh, of a few investigators working in the field, but it may affect human beings. So if, if it's coming close to clinical testing or it may affect the uh, environment at large or it may affect our, you know, energy disposition and, you know, the, the future of the economy, I would argue, you know, again, this needs to be replicated. Beyond that, there can be different viewpoints on how much we need replication versus discovery. I have a, a short paper coming out um, soon where I argue that in most circumstances, replication has more scientific value than discovery. And it's a mathematical model that uh, shows why that is the case. The situation where discovery has more scientific value than replication is when someone is working in the field where there's tons of discoveries and the chances of being wrong are very low. Then, yes, we, we just need to catch up. You know, we have hit a vein of gold and we, we just need to get as much of it as quickly as possible. Uh, some replication may happen later. That paradigm is not common. I mean, you know, think about how hard we work um, to get something that really makes a difference. Uh, it's not, not that common. In most circumstances, replication has very high scientific value. So it, it needs to be considered very seriously before we move to yet another possibility of a discovery to see where we are already. Awesome talk, uh, John. I'm stunned by the 98% or 98.5% of uh, publications that claim novelty. But uh, if this is the case, then uh, who will be, why will anybody write, will, will be willing to write a paper uh, to reproduce some of these results when they wouldn't be able to claim novelty. And how can you publish in Nature or Science or high-profile papers when you cannot claim novelty? So I, I would uh, replace novelty with information gain, which is a concept that is uh, the same as entropy change in physics. Um, you can have information gain, you can have a lot of informativity from a result that is not novel. Uh, conversely, a novel result sometimes may have very little I informativity. It may not change our landscape of what we know uh, meaningfully. And most results that are claimed to be novel actually have very limited informativity. You know, they're, they're just incremental 
tiny bits of information. Uh, a few years ago, we asked the authors of uh, uh, the most highly cited papers, the ones that had the, the highest citation impact on science, to tell us what they thought about their most cited work. And the strongest grades that they gave to their own work was not on novelty and innovation. Uh, they gave high grades mostly on incremental uh, information and on synthesis, putting together some elements that were floating around but were not condensing yet. So I, I, I think that even though novelty sounds uh, nice, it's, it's kind of a misplaced goal in a sense. And uh, there's other dimensions that are probably far better to focus on rather than just say that you need to find something novel. Of, of course, this is what happens in most funding agencies and this is why all of us claim that we will find something novel. But I don't know about you, I think I haven't found lots of novel things in my life. Maybe I found nothing, who knows. Here. Somebody talking? Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say that what you, you talk actually is very scary, like what she said, but it's really very confusing because, listen, we have scientific theories, we have scientific laws, we have scientific what? Things that are not questionable are becoming scientific laws, like the law of thermodynamics, the law of what? What are we going to do with those? Should we go back and check <laughs> the reproducibility of those stuff in order to, to confirm that there are laws? Or what should we do? So there's, there's a gradient of credibility. Um, and you know that gradient goes from 0% to 100%. I, I think that the laws of thermodynamics have worked very well. Uh, they have been reproduced uh, in, in millions of observations. Uh, now, could it be that at some point they may fail? <sighs> I don't know. You know. Someone may win a Nobel Prize out of that at, at, at some point, much like uh, relativity theory uh, replaced uh, Newton's gravity. But for, for this type of kind of classic knowledge, I don't feel uncertain. I think that we can tell people that these laws have worked very well. You know, we can continue using them, and actually, if someone wants to claim that here is a counterexample where they fail, the amount of evidence needs to be very strong. Uh, so if someone wants to claim that the speed of light uh, can be exceeded, uh, which is what happened like three years ago, it was just an error. And, and this happens every couple of years, but almost always you go back and it is an error. There are many, many, many other findings that have much lower credibility, that is very close to 0%. And it's important for us as scientists to be able to convey both to ourselves and to colleagues, and, and also to the general public for questions that pertain to the general public, roughly what is our level of credibility. So in epidemiology, I need to be able to tell people that smoking kills people, that unless we do something, one billion people will die because of smoking in the next century. How likely is that to be true, that smoking is killing people? This is 100%. Do you want me to be a scientist? Yes, it's 99.999999, you know, add as many nines as you want. What are the chances that broccoli are killing people? You will find 50 papers saying that it's very close to 0%. You know, if you want to spend your time and you're not bored of this type of stuff in the news, you know, read one more paper or one more news story. We need to convey that level of credibility a bit carefully because otherwise we see people being completely confused. We see lots of anti-science. People don't want to vaccinate their kids. People believe that there's no climate change. People believe that there's no HIV and no AIDS and, and we do not convey in that massive amount of information that is circulating about science that these are things that are like 100%. So, um, as I said, I, I agree with a lot of things that you said, and uh, I think it's extremely important that we discuss this kind of issues. Uh, however, this 
there are some uh, other problems that may need to be addressed. So in physics, maybe it's simple, or in chemistry, it may be simple. But in biology, which is in incredibly complex, we might have a huge problem of reproducing, reproducing evolution in the past three billion years, or understanding how it happened. And this has to do with the argument Monod has put together. It's very difficult to trace back what's happened. So it's possible to discover things that are, uh, I think there in physics there's this uh, very special word, a sort of unique event, uh, which happened because of statistical um, uh, statistics of uh, things happening in particular niche and adaptation to particular area or uh, utilizing a particular chemical. So uh, in this respect, interpretation of some of these results might be very different. And we have to take into account this. And as sequencing actually brings all this information together, again, we have the issue of models. I mean, we have certain models of genomes, we have certain models of genes, we have certain models of organisms. They may be things that we may discover, like meta, meta, uh, are, uh, meta, meta archaeal that been discovered some 40 years ago when people have not think about this at all. So there are still things to discover because we have not exploited all the options that exist on Earth. Absolutely. I think we need to remain open to possibilities that are disruptive and uh, we haven't even imagined. I mean, if you, if you take a snapshot of science going backwards, uh, some of our knowledge would be entirely unanticipated based on what we knew back then. And I'm sure that the same would be told, hopefully, a uh, hundred years down the road or even earlier for what knowledge we have now. We, we need to remain open to these possibilities. And none of the research practices that I, I describe are aiming to just solidify and gel science in its status quo. They're just trying to liberate and optimize the chances of having this type of disruption. Hey there, uh, that was a wonderful talk. Um, so my question has to do a little bit with uh, science literacy and uh, the education of um, <coughs> statistical methods uh, within the academic community. So something that I've noticed um, while I've been in academia is the fact that a lot of people who get involved with the biological sciences uh, tend to find themselves thrown into this world of computation and not only are they trying to learn the statistics that they need in order to um, uh, perform best data practices, but they're also trying to learn uh, how to code and how to program simultaneously. And since you're learning both at the same time potentially, you run into frustrations that um, you are kind of unique because you have this problem that you're not entirely sure, is it, okay, is this a statistical problem with my model, or am I getting this error because there's some form of syntax error? And of course, if you happen to have a background in computer science, these kinds of things may sort themselves out, but that's not necessarily the case with everyone in academia. So my question for you is, what kinds of things can we be doing to maybe help decouple some of these problems that we run into as we're trying to learn these methods. Um, again, it might be helpful if we have uh, the learning of the statistics side of things and the programming side of things separately, but that may not be accessible and available to everyone. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So you're, you're touching on, on a major challenge, uh, and I, I believe that it's like uh, the need to have a license to kill. Uh, you need a license to analyze, uh, a license to uh, perform some types of analysis or use some types of methods. And, and this license needs to be uh, renewed. Uh, otherwise, you know, much, even James Bond gets renewed every 10 years or so. Uh, so, uh, and, and science moves faster than James Bond uh, movies. So. How, how do we deal with that? I, I think 
we need a shift on what are the priorities in education and in continuing education. Uh, until very recently, probably the balance was more on uh, mastering uh, some technologies because also the, the, uh, the rise in new measurement tools was very fast at the, at the bench level. Uh, I think that the data component and the statistical, biostatistical computational component is, is going through a revolution and people need to be able to be cognizant about what can be done, what cannot be done, what are the limitations and the caveats for each one of these methods when they're employed. So th that, that needs a, a complete shift of attention of the curriculum of universities, of graduate programs, of postdoctoral programs, of funding agencies, what type of, of the new research workforce they support. But it has to happen now because we, we, we see that on a daily basis. So, so my, my question is sort of related to the previous one. So a lot of us receive a basic statistical education when we're undergrads and sometimes in graduate school. And uh, there's a lot of fixation on our ability to make this statement saying that this result is statistically significant. So, so I wonder to what extent do you think this is actually the, the problem of the whole thing? So in the sense that p-value is really not they shouldn't be a hard threshold in some way, because if you adjust either way, for example, you propose to be 0.004 or 0.005, then the false, false negative rates start to increase. And so it depends on what kind of risk one wants to take. So I wonder if you can comment on, along those lo that line. Yeah, I, 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 as I said, the, the proposed shift to lower levels of statistical significance is just a temporizing measure. It's a very crude correction of big chunks of the literature that have not done that already. So, you know, genomics has already gone to genome-wide significance of five times tens to the minus eight. Uh, many other fields are using already false discovery rates or Bayesian approaches. I, I'm not worried about those. I'm worried about the vast majority of the literature because ac across the life sciences and biomedicine, there's a hundred times more papers that use p-values than papers that use false discovery rates or Bayesian statistics. Uh, so for that vast amount of papers, the large majority would do better inferentially by moving that threshold. There will be some that will do worse. So, uh, but there's a balance of benefits and harms. And this is just temporizing. I, th I think we need to build that new generation and train also our existing scientists to use better inferential tools. Uh, so uh, this means that 80% of the p-value type of analysis need to be replaced by something different. But, but we need to do something now and something easy that most of the 20 million people who publish scientific papers can understand tonight. Uh, so it, it, it sounds very easy, m maybe even stupid, but... I'm trying to get something that most of these 20, 20 million people will understand tonight.